Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 3rd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why we think recent op-eds by Larry Persley and others on Alaska's fiscal situation avoid the important question. Second, a breakdown of the costs of oil production and why we think Prop 1 is an acceptable addition. And third, why what the Congress does on the next COVID package is important to Alaska. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off with uh, what seems to be our weekly discussion, which is the PFD. Some people just don't seem to get it. They don't seem to understand what we're talking about. Uh, And they, of course, get the bully pulpit of the op-ed and everything else out there. Uh, and uh, today is no different. We're going to start off with that. Brad Keithley, good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? Good, sir. Good. So the PFT, some people just don't seem to understand what we're talking about. Yeah, so the, the thing that triggered uh, this is a is a op-ed over the weekend in the Anchorage Daily News by Larry Persley, again, uh, talking about the PFD again. Uh, and suggesting that the PFD, uh, the candidates who are supporting a full PFD, uh, are, uh, are are misleading the public, and uh, because we can't afford it, it uh, according to Larry again, um, and and this this is a string of op eds, not only about the PFD, but we're but we have and we're going to see them about oil taxes, and we have and we're going to see them about an income tax. It's 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 op eds that focus on one piece of of the puzzle, one one alternative for trying to deal with the two point three billion dollar uh, gap we're facing in uh, FY twenty two and beyond, um, and and focus on that one piece and said, well, you can't do this, you can't do PFD cuts, or, or you can't you can't you cannot do uh, can't help but do PFD cuts because we have to fill the the two point three billion. Uh, you can't do uh, uh, income taxes. You can't do um, uh, uh, taxes on oil, and and taking in isolation each of these each of these each of these elements and trying to rip apart uh, uh, people who take one one side or or the other of it. I, I I've come to the conclusion, and it really struck me as I was reading Larry's latest piece again. Uh, it, it struck me that we're just we're going at this wrong. And 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 we need to be you know rethinking how we're approaching uh, discussing these issues. The, the 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 truth of the matter, the basic fundamental fact we've got to confront is we've got a 2.3 billion dollar deficit right. uh, in uh, in FY22 and the rest of the decade uh, beyond that. Um, and and we got to deal with that. I mean, it's, it, we're out of savings. We've we've drained all the savings. We're out of savings. We got to deal with that. Two point three billion dollar deficit. Some people, uh, and and I've been among those since the beginning of this decade or the last decade. Uh, some people say we've got to cut. Uh, we certainly do have to cut, but it's unrealistic to think. It's it's just wholly unrealistic to think we're going to cut two point three billion dollars. So so the answer is what what else do we do? Um, and I think the standard that we ought to apply is what has the lowest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. That, those ought to be the two uh, uh, drivers uh, of any analysis uh, to, to try to figure out 
what is what is harmful and what's not harmful, uh, relatively not harmful, uh, on the overall Alaska economy, overall Alaska economy, and what is harmful and not harmful on or least harmful on Alaska families. There is no free lunch option. There is nothing that 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 doesn't have some impact someplace, some adverse impact someplace. Right. Oil oil taxes will have an adverse impact on oil companies. PFD cuts have an adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, income taxes have an adverse impact depending upon how you do the the, the whether you use a progressive or a flat uh, uh, has an impact on somebody. There is no no cost option. So I think we ought to be looking at instead of these isolated. Um, uh, op-eds and these isolated analysis that say, well, you can't do this for the, you can't do this one, you can't do this one, you can't do this one. I think we ought to, ought to start with the standard that says, let's figure out what has the lowest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families, um, and and start from there and analyze the various options through that filter and decide how we build. Uh, a response to the $2.3 billion deficit in a way that hurts us the least. Um, and, and, and these op-eds, I think they're just, uh, anymore, I think they're just wastes of time because they're just focusing on this single aspect and said, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, or you should do well, this, or you should do this, or, or should do that. Yeah, no, I mean, I love the, uh, I love the fact that he, uh, you know, first of all, he's getting a huge amount of airplay on this with the ADN. Is that this like his fourth or fifth op-ed against the PFD? Uh, and then I love that how he uses this uh, this argument uh, down there in the middle of the argument. He goes, you know, if uh, if the money were stolen, because people say that the money's been stolen by the PFD, if the money were stolen, the recipients of stolen funds would be required to return the money. Does this candidate suggest that school districts, troopers, domestic violence centers, and snowplow drivers return their state funds as reparation? I mean, come on. This is, I mean, it's reduction to the ridiculous, but this is where he said, like, there's no place in the state that we could find cuts uh, to do that, on top of the fact that most of this money that was taken is still sitting in the ERA. I mean, if you're going to be honest about it, the money's still sitting there. The vast majority of it was never taken out of the ERA. So, I mean, this whole thing just doesn't, the whole thing is just smells bad. It doesn't pass the smell test. Well, but at, at no point, I mean, at no point does he confront, and and, to, and frankly, to, to a lot of the other people who write on these issues, confront what the relative impact on the Alaska economy and Alaska families is from 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 taking these actions. He I mean, he he says we ought to be doing PFD cuts that that we that that you know that's the that's the that's the right way to do it. But he never confronts. He never has in all in all the stuff he's written. Uh, and in all the stuff everybody has written, frankly, they never confront the the 2016 ICER analysis that says they have the largest the largest adverse PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy, and in the 27 analysis that ICER did and the, the ITEP did that it has the largest adverse impact uh, on Alaska families. Uh, it, they, they just they skip over that. So we're, we're talking about this stuff in a way. That is 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 disconnected from what's important to the to the Alaska economy and Alaska families. That ought to be the starting point of any of these analysis. What is it that uh, what's what's the impact of what I'm proposing on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families? That's what that's what ought to be important. And then how do I ameliorate or how do I respond to or why is my proposal uh, better than somebody else's because my proposal has a lower impact? On the Alaska economy and Alaska families, right. that's Larry has never ever uh, uh, addressed that issue. It's like if you ignore it, it will go away. Well, it doesn't go away. Well, that it, should be that should be the starting point of what we're talking about. The, that should be the starting point of what we're talking about when we talk about any tax, right, uh, or well, any revenue measure. Well, let's dig down into that then, real quick. Here, I want to get on to number two, but let's talk for a minute then about what is the. You know, I mean, times money, times value of money in the private economy versus the public economy, and what is the impact? And just break me, break me off some quick numbers here, Brad, and tell folks exactly what we're talking about when you're talking about direct economic impact of that PFD being taken away. Well, you're talking about you're talking about two things. The the, the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families for two reasons. 
One is it only taxes Alaskans. It only takes money out of Alaskans' hands. Unlike a broad-based pet tax, like a sales tax or a flat tax or other other taxes, it uh, the, the PFD cuts takes nothing. It has no contribution coming from non-Alaskans, uh, Alaskans who who have Alaska or or people who have Alaska sourced income but don't live in the state, non-residents who have Alaska sourced income. It takes nothing from them. So the entire burden of PFD cuts is focused only on Alaskans. It only takes money out of the Alaska private sector. It doesn't it doesn't broaden that as do other states and take a portion of it from uh from 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 elsewhere. And that increases the adverse impact on Alaskans by about 10% because 10% of the if you used another revenue measure, another broad-based revenue measure, 10% of that money would come from 7 to 10% of that money would come from non-residents. The second the second reason it has the large PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on, on the overall Alaska economy, Alaska families, is because it takes the bulk of the money out of middle and lower income Alaska families. And they're the ones who are most likely to spend that money, uh, that marginal dollar, in the Alaska economy. Right. A marginal dollar to the top 20% tends to be either saved or invested or, or spent outside as opposed to being spent in the Alaska economy. So so you're, you're taking money from those who are most likely – to you to spend that dollar, generate additional economic activity in the state, uh, and create an additional uh, knock-on effect through uh, through injecting that money uh, into the economy. That the, the PFD because of those two factors, the PFD has the largest adverse impact. So what you want to look for is something that 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 ameliorates, av- avoids those two impacts. One is a broad-based approach. That takes money both from residents and non-residents, uh, uh, and and a second that uh, uh, takes money broadly across all income classes, as opposed to focusing it on middle and lower income Alaska families, so taking focusing the take from middle and lower income Alaska families, um, and that is the that 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 has the lowest adverse impact. Again, there's no free lunch here. There's there's no option that that doesn't have some impact, and so you look for impacts. You look for impacts that are that are the lowest on both the economy, have the least Im- adverse impact on the economy, um, and have the least adverse impact uh, on Alaska families. We got some questions. Uh, let's see. Um... We see what stealing the people's PFD does to the Alaskan economy, so let's get off the PFD and quit choking off the private sector. Uh, and I agree with that. And one thing we didn't touch on, although I mentioned it, is uh, you know not just the impact that Brad was talking about from you know high end to low end, but also the times value or the the, the, the times turn of money in the economy. Uh, you know, it's kind of uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, I saw a study from one of the universities that talked about how money flows uh, in a given economy, and there's you know the money turns so many times meaning that that dollar is used to then leverage to make another dollar. And in the private economy, it was like six and a half to seven times for a dollar. And in the public economy, it's like 1.5, like the dollar only turns 1.5, maybe two times. Brad, you want to address that real quick? Well, there's a lot of ways to do those numbers. The ICER 2016 report does that uh, and has uh, uh, has the, the knock-on effect uh, uh, of each dollar. The PFD, uh, in the way that they're doing the numbers, uh, which is a different from the way uh, that the number would have been when you're talking about the six the six times, uh, the PFD has a has a churn effect or a knock on effect of 1.4 times. That is, for each uh, dollar spent, uh, or for each dollar uh, distributed in PFD, that circulates in the economy 1.4 times before it goes into somebody's savings account. Uh, or leaves the state uh, in some transaction where the dollar leaves the state. That's the highest, uh, and, and, and again, this goes with the fact it's in the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. They're spending it, and they're generating that knock-on effect uh, uh, as a result of of spending it. Other dollars that, uh, that uh, uh, are being spent have a lower knock-on effect. Uh, state dollars have do generate some activity because state dollars go to either contractors or they go to uh, employees and those employees then spend the dollars before they uh, before they stay, stay uh, before they leave the state 
uh, or was going to somebody's savings account. But all of those, uh, all of those factors are less than the knock-on effect uh, of the um, uh, of the PFD. If the PFD, if, if if ICER had instead restated those numbers on the same basis that you're talking about before, that the six six times, uh, if they use the factors that will let you do it that way. Uh, then all of the other uh, spending categories or all of the other uh, tax categories would have a have a lower impact, a lower economic impact uh, than the PFD. I mean, it's it's it, it it's basically simple. If you put money, I mean, that's the reason that the Feds are doing are doing what they're doing. I mean, in in terms of their the COVID relief programs, if you put money in the hands of middle and lower income families, they will spend it. They will generate activity in in the economy. Right. If you put hands, uh, if you put, if you keep, if you keep money or put money in the hands of, of the top twenty percent or the top one percent or the top ten percent, whatever you want to take as your number, uh, it tends to go into savings. That marginal dollar tends to go in savings accounts or investments. It doesn't flow immediately into the economy. It doesn't flow uh, into uh, into immediate economic activity, right. uh, and certainly not economic activity uh, in Alaska. So, it's um, uh, that's what you're looking for. How do you generate the largest amount of economic economic activity? And as I say, the other thing with the PFD is if you if you take it if you take money out of the economy through PFD, you're only taking it out of the you're taking it only out of the hands of Alaskans. So you're reducing the amount of Alaska economic activity uh, disproportionately. If you take it out of the hands of of, of all uh, people with not with uh, Alaska sourced income, including including non revenue or non residents. You're, t- you're, you're affecting the Alaska economy to some extent. But you're also affecting maybe the Oklahoma economy or the or the Texas economy, wherever those non-residents non-residents live. You're not taking it all out of the Alaska economy. Uh, Charlie in the in the chat room says, "Would Brad's flat tax have no exemptions? Would everyone pay a percentage of their income?" Yep. Yeah. Including in, including including the lowest twenty percent. But it's a great it's a great it's a great deal for the lowest twenty percent because they get the PFD back. They pay a portion of the PFD in tax, but they get the PFD back. So it's a it's a net positive for for the lowest twenty percent. The only people who pay more uh, under a flat tax is the top twenty percent, and they but they don't pay any more than anybody else. So if everybody else is paying four percent, the top twenty percent pays four percent. Under they, PFD cuts, the top twenty percent pay less than a percent. Uh, and you have the bottom twenty percent paying, you know, more than twenty percent. So, yeah, yes, everybody would pay the same. Pamela asks a question, which I think is a good question, but also I think has a pretty uh, obvious answer. She says SB fifty seven and similar bills can bring in over four hundred million dollars. Why is this not being addressed? Whether this state needs revenue or not, why is it not being addressed? Your thoughts quickly. Well, SB fifty seven is the one where you you upstream property taxes that go to the to, that go to local government and upstream it to the state. That didn't even get. I mean, we have to be we have to deal with realistic options, right? That didn't even get a hearing uh, uh, when first introduced two years ago by the governor. Not one hearing by the legislature. The governor didn't press it uh, last year, like he did on a lot of things. He backed off on it last year. Yeah, it'd be great. Sure, let's take the money out of the. Local government and upstream to the government lessen the government's problem. The local government's problem, but if we're focused on the state government, that's a great thing to do. But it's not a realistic option. It didn't even get a hearing in the legislature. There's no political will right now to basically do that. Is is part of the problem. They, nobody wants to have that stuff sucked out of the their their local municipality, and they'll fight tooth and nail on that. Um, all right. Uh, final thoughts here, Brad. One minute. Well, the final the final thought, Michael, is is I understand that people don't like uh, 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 oil taxes. I understand that people don't like a broad based flat tax. I understand that people don't like uh, 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 PFD cuts. But you've got but there's got to be some solution. We've got a two point three billion dollar deficit. There's got to be some solution to that. We're not going to cut our way uh, out of it. Not even the governor's first round of proposals was only a billion dollars uh, of cuts, barely a billion dollars of cuts. Um, and he didn't even, there's not even anything on the table that comes close to 2.3 billion. There will be revenues. We need to look for the revenues that have the lowest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on Alaska families. That ought to be the standard by which we're judging. 
Yeah, I would hope so. Uh, James says realistically, there was no, there's no hearing on income tax by the legislature. It will be backed off on no political will either, except that there's no money left to to spend. I mean, I guess unless they tap the ERA for it, I just don't see them. Uh, you know, they they're, they're going to have to face the reality eventually. So, let's uh, start teasing into number two. I mean, number one, you know, we need to have somebody. Somebody needs to write an op-ed that focuses on some of these issues, and hopefully, we can get somebody in there to uh, to elucidate this for folks. But let's move on to number two, which is, again, the price of a barrel of oil. And you've got a good breakdown. In fact, Ed King has contributed to this, uh, putting together pretty good numbers on how to make this work. Yeah, you can look at um, – uh, I started into a detailed analysis over the weekend after you forwarded the question. But then Ed came up with – on Monday, had published uh, his usual monthly piece uh, and, uh, and, and sort of summarized the numbers in a way that was convenient and people can look at and uh, – and 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 doesn't inflict uh, one of my charts on somebody. So, um, in the middle of his uh, in the middle of his piece, he's, he's talking, he's summarizing FY uh, twenty. He says taking the total production of 176.4 million barrels times the average price over last year over FY twenty of fifty two dollars and twelve cents yields a total gross revenue nine point two billion dollars of total oil. Subtracting the estimated point five billion. The oil companies paid to employees, contractors, and Alaskan businesses, and you can get that out of the annual uh, revenue forecast. Um, and the 1.7 billion they paid to state and local government, that leaves a net cash flow of about 1 billion to pay federal taxes and provide investors with a return on their capital. Of that 1.7 billion, uh, about a billion of that is royalty. Um, so the the breakdown uh, using these numbers is 9.2 billion of total value oil value from the from A and S, uh, 6.5 billion uh, paid to employees, contractors, and Alaskan businesses, a billion paid in royalty, contractual royalty that the companies agreed to at the time that that they took the leases as part, partial compensation for getting the rights to the land, and 700 million. Uh, essentially, in uh, in taxes paid to state and uh, and local government, and the and after that, uh, net of all that, you leave about a billion uh, uh, for federal taxes and uh, and provide investors a return on the capital. Ed said, in other words, if we look at oil taxes the same way that we treat other businesses, they paid an effective tax rate of around 63 percent in FY20. Well, that 63 percent includes the royalty. And I'm not sure I would I, I wouldn't classify royalty as a as as a tax. So if you exclude the royalty from that calculation, the effective tax rate in FY20 um, uh, is about uh, 40 percent uh, on on uh, uh, on uh, the 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 revenues coming from uh, from oil. That's that's what we're talking about on existing uh, in terms of existing taxes. Brad, can you break it back for us here just to give us some. Rough estimates of what we're talking about here on a barrel of oil and what uh, Prop 1 might actually generate? Well, Michael, I don't have my calculator handy to be able to divide uh, 9.2 billion by 176.4 million barrels. Uh, but that's, I mean, you can do it from the from the Ed King analysis. It's just a simple division of of total dollars by uh, total barrels, and he's got all of the uh, all of the factors there to be able to do it. The the the, the Prop 1. Um, uh, analysis, though, is is fairly simple. You take the the, the total increase uh, of of Prop One at at uh, at the projected price, um, and it's about uh, uh, at forty dollars or forty five dollars. It's in the neighborhood of two hundred and fifty uh, to two hundred and eighty million dollars of of additional revenue, uh, and you take that on top of of current costs, and it increases current costs by about three percent. Uh, so you would have the impact on on the the per barrel price, whatever whatever calculation you come out to when you divide these numbers by 176.4, you would increase the uh, uh, the total cost by about three percent. Now that's 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 uh, oil price dependent. Uh, if oil prices were eighty dollars instead of forty to forty five dollars, the 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 percentage would be. Would be higher if oil prices were twenty dollars instead of forty to forty-five dollars. Uh, the impact would be lower. Um, uh, but at the range of oil prices that we're looking at uh, uh, going forward, 
uh, it's about 3% uh, of the, uh, an increase of about 3% on the total cost uh, of, uh, of producing a barrel of oil. We've had a lot of people say uh, on the show, we've had a lot of people say in comments, the, the you know, the passing Prop, Prop 1 would have this horrible impact uh, on the on the oil industry, and it would uh, uh, result in in this adverse economic impact on on uh, the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. I accept, there again, there is no free lunch option here. There is no there is no uh, uh, alternative where Alaska doesn't suffer some harm. That's the that's the situation we've got ourselves into by overspending. Uh, relative to revenues all of these years by, by cushioning it, by using savings until savings ran out. Uh, that's the situation we've got ourselves into. And now to pay for it, uh, pay for that situation that we've got ourselves into, there is going to be some economic, adverse economic impact uh, on the overall Alaska, on the, on the Alaska economy. But you need to, you can't just say that and stop the discussion. You can't just say, oh, raising oil taxes is going to have an adverse impact on the Alaska economy. I win. We can't raise oil taxes. Anything we do is going to have an adverse impact uh, on the Alaska economy. The question is, what has the most adverse impact? What, what, has, the, what has the most uh, 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 downside for the overall Alaska economy and, and Alaska families? That's the question. It's not the question. You, you don't win the game if you just say, oh, it'll have an adverse impact, period. Not, uh, and you, you, that's, that's not winning the game. That's, that's, that's saying, okay, it has an adverse impact. Now let's, let's compare it relative to others. And the situation we have gotten ourselves into uh, is that the only option right now that's on the table to PFD cuts, well, there's two options on the table. One is to continue PFD cuts, which we started in 2016, and the other is oil tax, the, the, the Prop 1 oil tax. It's a 3% increase in, over, in overall cost. The question is, what, which of those has the larger adverse impact? Now, I wish that there was a third option on the table, which was something like a flat tax that, that had Alaskans pay for their, their own government in a, in a broad-based, equitable, low-impact way. But there's not. It's not on the table. So what we've got on the table right now is either continued PFD cuts or somewhat or, 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 or a, a portion of those PFD cuts that don't have to occur because, uh, because of Prop 1. And so you compare the adverse impacts. You don't, you don't get to say, just say, look, there's adverse impacts from oil taxes. So, um, uh, so you know, that's it. No oil taxes. Right. You don't get to say that. You've got you've to compare it. And when you compare the two, yes, oil taxes have an impact. We'll have some marginal impact on, on, on oil investment. We'll have some marginal impact on the oil sector of our economy. But when you compare, to, compare the two, the larger adverse impact of the two is through PFD cuts. So if you're concerned about, if you're really concerned about the overall Alaska economy, you need to be concerned about PFD cuts before you're concerned about oil taxes. We got a little bit of time here for number three. Uh, which is what happens next in the economy? What uh, what goes on from here, and uh, what happens if you know what happens with Congress, and and you know what 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 goes on here overall in the economy? Yeah. So so we're facing the situation where Congress is is addressing the next round of COVID uh, COVID relief, and and we're facing the situation in which Alaska has, Alaska as well as the rest of the nation, has benefited in the sense of they've had money pumped into their economies uh, from the previous rounds of COVID relief. And one of the big ways that we've had money pumped into the economy is through the unemployment, the supplemental unemployment that the, that the federal government has been, has been paying. That and other pieces uh, of the uh, of the of the federal response is now at issue. What what are the feds going to do about it? And and it's important to focus on the fact that uh, that that the supplemental unemployment has had a big impact on Alaska as well as elsewhere, but it's had a big impact uh, on Alaska. There was a, uh, uh, a Department of Labor put out the Alaska Economic Trends, the latest Alaska Economic Trends yesterday. There's an article in there about what the impact, the positive impact that's been had by. Uh, by the by, the, the COVID rounds. Um, 
the, the, the point is this. The point is I and others are concerned about, you know, the, the long-term effects of, of increasing the federal deficit. Uh, another round of COVID relief will, will increase the federal deficit. But we have to understand that not doing that round of COVID relief will have a, a fairly big impact uh, on on the overall uh, Alaska economy, on on that portion of the Alaska economy uh, that is that's currently unemployed, uh, receiving supplemental uh, unemployment assistance, that that will that and that's rippling through the Alaska economy as they spend that money. It, it, taking that away will have a big impact on the Alaska economy. Yesterday, uh, a- Andrew Kitcheman of uh, of uh, Alaska Public Media said that the, the Alaska Department of Labor estimates the state will lose $87 million in August from the expiration of the $600 in federal enhanced unemployment insurance. That equals 5% of wages in, in a normal August, a bigger drop. Uh, the loss of, of that will result in a bigger drop uh, than the, the loss in wages we had in the last recession. We've been buoyed. The Alaska economy has been buoyed, as well as the rest of the country, has been buoyed by uh, the unemployment has been buoyed by the $1,200 payments that came to families uh, earlier in the cycle. If those go away, we need to be prepared uh, for the fact that the Alaska economy is going to take a big hit. Lots of numbers in this article on the Frontiersman that goes over the economic recovery report uh, from ICER and others, the analysis of this. And, uh, you know, it's not looking good. I mean, Ed King in his article talked about a 40 percent job loss. Excuse me, 40,000 jobs lost in uh, fiscal year last year. And, uh, you know, and Musin Gutabi from ICER continues to go on there and talks about even, you know, it, they're predicting it's not going to even be till 2022 that we start to see some rebound on this. Well, and that's, I mean, Musin's article uh, or Musin's analysis assumes the continuation of federal relief. Uh, to get us back there. I mean, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the, with the level of federal relief that we've, that we've been pumping into the economy. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with the amount of deficit that we're running, what we're doing to future generations. Uh, but we have to recognize that if we, t- if we take that, that segment out of the economy, if we remove that segment from the economy, even the Alaska economy is remote from D.C. as it is, if we remove that that support out of the Alaska economy, we're gonna. It's going to be worse. Right. We think we have it. We think we have it bad now. But it's going to get worse. Well, isn't this the same kind of choice that you were talking about earlier? When we've got nothing but bad choices. I mean, we've got you know, it's the it's the the PFD or it's a tax or it's this or it's. I mean, it's the same kind of thing, right? I mean, there all there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything we do is going to hurt us in one way or the other. Do we hurt us in the long term by borrowing money from the Fed to pump it up now, or do we let the whole thing go kablooey and see what happens from there? Exactly right. Exactly right. It is. It is the 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 the, the least worst. You're looking for the least worst uh, choice, and you have to. There, you have to break that down by current, the current generation and future generations. From the standpoint of future generations, it may be at the least worst choice is to let everything go kablooey now. From the standpoint of the current generation, it's horrible to let everything to go kablooey now, but you do it at the expense of future generations. It's all relative. And, and just to focus, I mean, to go back to the theme of the day, I suppose, just to focus on one aspect and say that's bad so we can't do it, that's not enough. It's relative. You get, you've got to look at that option compared to the next option compared to the next option. But there is. But we need to confront the fact that if we if we pull away, uh, pull out the, the 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 federal relief that we've been that we've been using that's been pumped into the economy overall uh, to deal with uh, with COVID. Uh, if we pull that out. There is going to be a big impact uh, on the on the Alaska economy. We're going to have uh, we're going to have a lot of the of the unemployed sector unable to pay rent. We're going to have them unable to uh, to meet uh, or meet their mortgage payments. We're going to have them in a position where they're they're significantly reduced uh, uh, significantly reduced economic uh, uh, input into the into the economy, and that's going to have knock on effects. Uh, I think that means I think that the balance is we we maintain COVID relief in some form, not at the extent that we have, because frankly we're probably inflating the economy. We're over we're, we're overcompensating under the current uh, federal supplemental uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, uh, Alaskans as well as elsewhere are receiving more in terms of total total uh, uh, unemployment 
uh, benefits than they received as income uh, when they were employed. So we've got to drain some of that out because we're inflating the economy uh, the way we're going. But the, but, but the complete abandonment of the program, I think we have to recognize, has consequences. Um, Brad, uh, Keith Lee, thank you so much, my friend, for coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate uh, you coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.